Today I'm going to build a better set of ruins. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Black Magic Craft. Every terrain builder and crafting DM has likely built a set of ruins at one point in time. I myself have built several, and I even made a video about it uh, early on in the channel. The problem I have with the type of ruins I built previously, well, actually there's a bunch of problems, a bunch of things I don't like. The main thing I don't like is that a building like this is static. It can only be one building that will never get bigger, will never get smaller, will never change in shape. And I don't really like that. I want ruins that can represent big buildings, small buildings, and buildings of every shape and size. You're really gonna end up with small buildings because you're not gonna want to build a bunch of massive, huge pieces that you need to store. So you end up making small pieces and Let's be real, this is a very small building, and if you want to do something big and impressive for a big battle, this just ain't gonna cut it. We have to do it differently. I decided I wanted to make a set that was truly modular, that could be rearranged and used in a bunch of different configurations. I also wanted to be able to use it with my existing three by three tile set so that for these ruins, I only crafted the walls and then I could use tiles for the floor. So these pieces, these modular pieces needed to be made in a form factor that worked with those tiles. And I accomplished this and I'm pretty happy with how they turned out. I wanna say thanks to Dice Bard for sponsoring this build. It's a great place that you can get affordable dice for your game. If you use the promo code in the description below, they will send your order expedited shipping anywhere in the world for free. I'd like to highlight one product they sell in particular that I think is really cool, and that is the Adventurer's 29 piece dice kit. You get a whole set of polyhedral dice, but you get them in multiple. So you get several of each kind, but you get more of the ones that you use the most in D&D. So there's more D6s than D20s. Each size of dice is color coded, which means it's easy to reach into the bag and grab four D6 at one time. It's also really good for new players who are still confused and learning the various dice used in D&D. Let's zoom into the table and take a look at the finished pieces, how they're used, and what I did to make them really modular before we jump into the build. Here is a setup using these tiles integrated with some existing dungeon tiles. What's important about this set is that all of the various pieces that I've made are made with dimensions that are multiples of the same dimension as my tiles. So my tiles are three inches by three inches. So all of the wall segments work with that. The set is composed of a few different types of pieces. One is the small wall sections, and these are three inches long so that they occupy the length of one side of a dungeon tile. I then have larger wall sections and these are six inches long. I then have corner pieces. I made these corner pieces three inches by six inches so that they could wrap around two tiles. And it's important when you build these to make some that are each type of corner. Don't accidentally make a whole bunch that are the same. And then I have a few small singular column pieces that can be used for a multitude of different things. One thing they're really good for is representing a doorway. So if you have three tiles and you have a wall section on each of the outside ones, you can use two of these individual pillars and place them to represent an opening. They also work on inside corners and just in the middle for you know decoration or interior pillars. I also made some of these larger uh, square pillars that are two inches by two inches that could be used for all sorts of different things, either interior or exterior. And then I just have some small scatter rubble pieces that are nice to place outside of the walls where things have fallen down. The way I approach this is that on each section of wall, I had various heights and 
I made sure to leave a lot of places that were very playable so that you could place minis on them and minis could peer over the edge and I really went for playability. This is a setup making one big building with dungeon tiles. So let me just clear this away and build a different setup. So here we have the same pieces minus the dungeon tiles representing several buildings. And this is how you can use this set to represent a whole ruined city. You can arrange these in a ton of different ways to give you a lot of variety. Two things that are important to point out, these wall sections have a base that extends on one side to give them some mobility, but one side is completely flat so that they could line up to tiles perfectly. And the other thing that's important to know when we jump into the build is that when I say these sections are three inches or six inches, that's actually not entirely true. I made them all slightly smaller, one eighth of an inch smaller than their measurement so that they never end up accidentally being too big and interrupting each other when you use them with tiles. They don't need to be a perfect fit. They can be a bit smaller because you can space these apart since they're ruins and they will look fine. As you can see, these things are much more useful than just a singular static building. And I just completed this set this week, so I expect there's probably a lot of ways to use these and configure them that I haven't even thought of yet because I haven't really played around with them much, but I get the feeling that these, like my dungeon stackers, are going to get a lot of mileage and a lot of use, and I'm gonna be using them all the time. Now, let's build these ruins. This project requires a lot of individual bricks. So that means a lot of cutting on the proxon. And the size of the bricks doesn't really matter. It can be whatever you want. For this particular build, I made my bricks 3 8 of an inch uh, thick or wide by 3 quarters of an inch long. But pick a number, it doesn't really matter. Just make sure that whatever the width of the brick is, that the length is twice that so that two bricks high is the same as one brick long, yada, yada, yada. Essentially what I did here was rip a bunch of three eighths of an inch thick strips out of some inch and a half material. And then I textured it with a tin foil ball across both sides. After that, I ripped these strips down again to three eighths giving me rectangle strips that were already textured on two sides and really that was enough texture for me. I wanted the bricks to have really defined grout lines once these ruins were constructed, which meant that the strips that I had cut as is needed to have the edges filed down a bit and beveled so that there would be some separation between the bricks. And the easiest way to do this is just to sand all of the corners with a nail file. This is not really that fast in quantities this large, but it is the easiest. Something to keep in mind when doing this much sanding on styrofoam, however, is that that dust, that really fine dust, is actually really, really not good for you to be breathing in. It creates very small particles that can get into your lungs. So I really encourage you to wear a mask when doing mass sanding on foam. You don't need to wear a crazy respirator like I do. You can just wear a dust mask. It's just what I had on hand. Also, once you're done, make sure you have a shop vac on hand to clean everything up so this foam doesn't spread out through your entire house and make your whole family hate you. I wanted my bricks to be three quarters of an inch long, so I created a little guide strip with tape and marker just to give me those increments. You don't need to measure these precisely, but you want them kind of close. I'm not cutting these all the way through, and the reason for that is that I wanted them to have more of a rough end, so it looked more like stone, so I just sliced a little bit and I'm breaking them to get the cut. This way you get some nice texture on the end of each brick. Score and snap. You want to make an ungodly amount of bricks for this project because you don't want to run out mid-build. Just make lots. If you have too many, that's fine. You can use them again later for something else. 
For the actual construction, I based these on graphics medium weight chipboard. It's a nice thin material that's still fairly thick. On one of the straight edges, I marked out six inches. Well, actually I marked out five and seven eighths of an inch. For every length here, again, make them a bit shorter than your tile. Made that mark just so I knew where to stop the wall and then I started laying bricks. I attached the bricks with hot glue and I made my walls two bricks thick with an offset pattern. And I just kept building up higher and higher until it got to the point I wanted. The most important thing here is to make sure you leave some areas for miniatures to actually stand on and peer over so that these pieces are really playable. And you'll remember that I made one side of each of these walls totally flat so that they could butt up against tiles. But the other side, I had the base actually extend a little bit so that these things didn't fall over. So on that side, I actually just put some broken bricks and then cut out a kind of wavy natural pattern so that they didn't look like just rectangles sitting on the table. I wanted these bases to blend into the table, so I actually beveled the edges a little bit by carefully shaving them down with my knife and then sanding them a little bit with a nail file. Doing the corner pieces required a little bit more foresight, so what I did is I took a piece of chipboard and in the middle of it I used a carpenter square and marked out a perfect right angle. This gave me a line to flush my bricks up to so that they would fit on tiles nicely. I also did this in the inside of the piece of chipboard so that once I laid my wall, there was some excess material on the outside so that I could do that same sort of wavy stabilizing base as I did on the straight piece. After I had all of the wall sections that I wanted complete, I just used up a bunch of the extra bricks to make the random scatter pieces and pillars that I wanted in the set. To hide the chipboard bases, I decorated them using construction sand and some decorative rocks to look like rubble. I just coated the bases completely with PVA glue using a brush. I dropped in some bigger broken rubble type stone into the corners and then sprinkled the finer general sand to cover the rest of the base. I wanted to make sure the underside of these were properly sealed because essentially the chipboard is just paper and I didn't want them to warp or get all screwed up when I did the washes. So I coated the underside with my black Mod Podge mixture and then after that I moved on and coated the rest of the pieces. The paint job on these were pretty simple. I base coated them all in a dark gray and then I gave them a dry brushing with a suede. I decided to use this kind of tanny color instead of a lighter gray to bring in some earth tones to the stone. After that, I did a dry brushing of a white just to hit all of the highlights. After that, I gave everything a coating in a black wash, but I made a special mixture of black wash that had a lot more brown in it so that these really looked more dirty and earthy. After the wash dried, I wanted to highlight some of the edges again, so I came back in and gave them another very, very gentle dry brushing with the suede and then a very, very careful dry brushing with the white. I finished the set off by giving it a liberal coating in Minwax fast drying polyurethane in a satin finish just to protect the paint job, make it a little bit harder and to enhance the color a bit. I'm really happy with the way this project turned out. I think they look pretty good and more importantly, the modularity of the set is gonna make them really useful. Thanks again to Dicebard for sponsoring this build. Be sure to check them out and use the promo code in the description of this video. If you need to pick up any of the tools or supplies that I used in this build, head on over to blackmagiccraft.ca. There I have my essential equipment store where I list all of the tools and supplies that I use and recommend. If you love the videos that I make and you want to help me continue to make them, consider supporting Black Magic Craft on Patreon. Those funds are what allow me to dedicate so much time to making these videos for the community. So check out the site. I would love to have you as the newest member of the Black Magic Craft Fellowship. That's it for this week, guys. I hope you found this video useful and inspiring. If you did, hit that like button and drop me a comment below. 
I'd really like you to walk away from this build more with the concept than the techniques. The main purpose of this is the modularity and the way they tie in with existing tiles you already own. So by all means, make it your own, use your own materials, use your own building styles, take the concept and run with it. Until next week, guys, cheers, happy crafting and happy gaming. <laughs>